So, so faith, faith, faith. That's our first Sunday of Advent as you've gathered. I remember the first time that I gave a talk on faith, and I, had, I really was completely tongue-tied with the idea of coming up with anything. And the reason, I, I guess, is because it's just one of those things that's so like privately woven into our beings, you know? It's something that's just kind of deep within us, that sort of knowing. And so to break it apart and to begin to talk about it was a bit of a challenge. Now I've done a lot of talks on faith, and I found ways to break it apart and talk about it. But, um, but that, that essence, you know, I think about when I was a, a young girl, and my sister was making fun of me because I wanted to go to church. And my sisters were older, and she said, why do you want to go to church? I mean, who wants to go to church? How boring. And I was so surprised at the veracity with which this came out of me. And I said, because I have faith in God, OK? <laughs> And it just sort of hung in the air, and the whole family was kind of like, whoa, okay, everybody get ready for church. <laughs> and it's not necessarily that that church fed me so much, but it did feed my faith, and I'm so grateful for that. I never say I'm in a recovering what, you know, Lutheran, because I, I don't, you know, I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful for that start that I got, that foundation that I had. That, that, that spoke to that faith um, that, that has been the walk, that has changed many times over, as I bet you can attest to as well. But what is this faith? You know, part of the reason why I think initially it was hard for me to talk about it is because it's, it's based on this like deep kind of mystery. You know, it goes back to the, the source, the creator, that kind of energy. When we tap our faith, it's, it's way down deep and it's, and it's the essence of life, really. It's that knowing, that belief that, that, it, that we come, that all of life comes from this seed that is pure spirit. And so to just know that, you know, without necessarily proof, you know, sci faith always gets cast out and then science sort of catches up and proves, you know, and it's our work as spiritual beings to keep casting the faith. So, you know, people might think you're, you sound a little off when you say things like bears decorated the sanctuary, but I'm telling you, anything is possible. <laughs> And so it's, it's this kind of science and faith that helps us sometimes when we listen to the fusion of that, that helps us touch a bit of that mystery when those two points come together. Shayla Wright tells this story from the 50s when she was in fifth grade. And she came home after science class and she was just on fire with what she had learned. Fifth graders often get on fire with what they've learned, which is an exciting age, as some of you school teachers can attest to. I can't see Chris, but I know she would agree, Chris Gomes. Anyway, so, so Shayla comes home and she tells her mom that she's learned something really incredible in science. And her mom says, so, so what did you learn? And she, says, in, and she says, you know, she reminds us this was in the 50s, way before quantum physics. And she says, well, mom, when you look at a chair, or anything that's solid. It's not really solid. And her mom's kind of intrigued. It's not really how you think it is. And her mom says, what do you mean? And she said, well, it's just how it looks. But in actuality, it's made up of all these little particles called mole molecules and atoms. And they're zooming around and bumping into each other. And her mother looks very intrigued and stunned and says, are you sure that's what your teacher said? <laughs> and Shayla says, yes. And so mom says, and what are those little zooming things? What are they made of? And she said, I saved the best part for last. Those molecules and those atoms, they're just made of space. And she said her mother, the rest of the afternoon, the two of them together really, walked around touching solid things with a look of curiosity and deep bewilderment that everything that appears to be solid could be made of that space that we would call spirit. And she said it was if in that afternoon time stood still and my mother and I looked across a deep abyss in which our minds couldn't quite launch into the great mystery of being. That's where faith begins. It's in that kind of awe. It's in that kind of uh, things that we can actually touch 
but really there is a greater depth there, a mystery there. Our, our work of faith is really to pull the thread of that mystery into the mundane, to take that, that feeling that we have when we recognize that something isn't quite as it appears, but that there is something deeper going on inside of all material things, including us, we often think this is the end of us, right? The borders of this body. But we know in truth that there is just a permeating spirit. And so when we're reminded of that, our faith gets reactivated, that there is more going on here than meets the eye. And we can use that in everything that comes up in our lives. In fact, just use that very statement, you know? Somebody gets diagnosed with something. There is more going on here than meets the eye. As Linda just leaned over and told me about something going on in her life, she said, I know there's a pony in here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and so if we just keep phrasing it that way, we begin to allow ourselves to pull the mystery in to the mundane, to live from that place, that knowing, that faith-filled knowing that says everything is actually okay. In fact, it's more than okay. There are blessings abounding. There are miracles available. And all I have to do is open, like Shayla Wright's mother did, and just walk over and touch something solid and think about the fact that it's made of spirit. It's made of space, little particles zooming around and bumping into each other and co-creating. And that's what happens when our faith comes alive through us and we act it and we speak it and we co-create it, is that the little particles of knowing, the thoughts and the words and the feelings that we have that begin to align with spirit begin to bump up against one another and they form and co-create in the world. Whatever it is that we want to spring forth out of our faith you know we can create the other direction too, right? <laughs> our faith can be, based, we can believe in our fear-based ideas. You know, we can kind of come from that place and create from that place. Charles Filmer, our co-founder, wrote um, many articles that became books and a couple of books that he wrote from start to finish. I think his best title of all, my favorite, is Adam Smashing Power of Mind. And he wrote it, it actually was a series of articles written from the late 1800s until close to his death in 1948. And you know, the atomic age began in the 40s, and so many were looking to him as a spiritual leader to see what would he say about that when the first atomic bomb was dropped? What would he have to say about the atomic age? And what did he say was exactly what we would say today, that the directed power of human thought is far more powerful than we ever give it credit for. And we can innovate with this genius. We can create all kinds of things, but will we use it for destruction or for creation? It's always our choice. Will we use it for good or for evil? It's always our choice. And we will keep on with the brilliance of divine intelligence creating amazing things in the world. And will we use it for good energy, for positive energy? Or will we use it to blow each other up? It's always our choice. So where do we put our faith? Where do we, what, where do we pull that, that mysterious thread of source into our lives? And how do we use it? Where do we apply the knowing that we have? Charles Fillmore didn't often tell stories about himself and his own journey, but he does actually devote a chunk of the chapter on faith in Adam's Smashing Power of Mind to his own um, faith healing journey. And we often hear about his wife, Myrtle Fillmore, and her healing, which really spawned our whole movement. Charles was the skeptic. He was the kind of wait and see, you know, like let's, let's read about, is this really, you know, is this scientific, is this, you know, believable? And as he saw how it, sh how through, through faith healing, basically Myrtle heal healed her own body, he began to apply the same teachings. And this is his healing story. When I was a boy of 10, he said, I was taken with what was first diagnosed as rheumatism and later developed into a serious case of hip disease. I was in bed for over a year, he said, and from that point I was an invalid for the next 25 years or until I began the application of divine law. Two very large tubercular uh, abscesses developed at the head of my hip bone, 
while the doctors said it would finally drain away my life. But I managed to get on about with crutches and a four inch cork and steel extension on my right leg. The hip bone was out of the socket and stiff. The leg shriveled and ceased to grow. The whole right side became involved. I lost hearing in my right ear. My right eye was weak. From the hip to the knee, the flesh was a glassy adhesion and had little sensation. But when I began to apply, he says, the spiritual treatment, there was for a long time just a slight response in the leg, and I began to feel better. I found that I could begin to hear again with my right ear. And then gradually that I noticed that there was more feeling in my leg. And then as the years went by, the ossified joint began to get limber. And, I, and the shrunken flesh filled out until the right leg was almost equal to the left. Then I discarded the cork and steel extension and wore an ordinary shoe with a double heel about an inch high. Now the leg was about as large as the other. The muscles were restored. And although the hip bone was not yet in the socket, I'm quite certain that it soon will be and that I shall be made perfectly whole. I'm giving the minute details of my healing because it would be considered a medical impossibility and a miracle from a religious standpoint. However, I have watched the restoration year after year as I applied the power of thought, and I know it is under divine law. So I'm satisfied now that there is proof of a law that mind builds the body and can restore it. That's why unity exists today, because two people had unshakable faith in the spirit and the possibilities that could be created from the spirit. Two people worked the principles themselves until they saw success and they could share from that place. If you ever get the opportunity to go to Unity Village or specifically the Ninth and Tracy, the original church in Kansas City, do go there because you can feel the presence of Myrtle Fillmore in that office where people are known to have showed up and hung their crutches and their canes outside the office and walked out without them because they didn't need them anymore. That's the stock we come from. That's why we have this movement all over the world today, because it was based on faith and commitment to spirit that they would stay aligned to that spirit and abundance would flow in to support all the work that they imagined doing, the healing work. The, you know, and at the time, they didn't imagine churches or credentialed leaders or ministers, but that drew, grew out of the demand for the movement as the movement swelled. And why did it swell so much? Because it came down to that very essence, that source that we come from, that place of wonderment and awe when we say, there's something more inside here and inside here and inside you and inside this life, that there's something that we could tap. And when we tap that power, our faith gets activated. And when our faith gets activated, anything is possible, really anything, probable even. So it's, it's that knowing those moments when we come to that, you know, knowing that and then realizing that it's practice that brings it out. You know, years of practice on Myrtle and Charles's work, years of affirmative prayer and, and uh, meditation that allowed them to heal their bodies completely and that allowed them to attract all the abundance that they needed to build an amazing movement. So whatever it is that we're up to in our lives, we think are impossible mountains sometimes, you know, and, and what does Jesus say? But only all we need is a faith of a mustard seed, you know, just a little tiny particle of reminder of the foundation on which we stand, the essence of which we're made. And it is through that remembering that we can bring it forth. And we remember by practicing. Do you remember the man it's in Mark 9:24, who he's um, bringing his son to Jesus to be healed. And he says, you know, he's tried everything. He's been everywhere, as, you know, a lot of people today and then had been. And he's kind of on that last piece of hope. And he says, can you heal my son? 
will you heal him if you're able? And Jesus says, you know, if I'm able. <laughs> because Jesus is standing in that place of pure faith. The difference between Jesus and us is he never forgot who he was. He just never forgot. He didn't fall off and, you know, remember and forget, remember and forget. He stayed in the divine alignment. He stayed in that place of pulling that mysterious thread of source into life, practicing it, living it, speaking it, knowing it, and not forgetting. And so there he's faced with this person who's embodied in that total divinity, gets it completely aligned, human and divine, completely aligned. And so he, in the presence of that, when we are in the presence of spirit, when we are in presence of those ahas like Shayla Wright's mother, when we're in those moments where we get it, it's like, oh, yeah, right? When we're in, the pres in those moments, it's just like, oh, I completely get it. I'm aligned with it. I feel it. I feel the power. You know, we'll say often I've got God bumps or goose bumps, you know? It's those moments where it's just you feel it and you know it. It's especially lovely when you can share that with someone else and two people or more feel it. You know, there I am in the midst of you. So, um, so the, the man is standing there waiting and after Jesus says, if I'm able, and he, like from that place of, you know, when we get it, when we recognize who we are, when we touch the presence, you know, when in those moments, it's humbling what we've been given, the gifts that we've been given as divine beings. And it's like one of those humbling moments and these passionate pleas. And the man says, I believe, help my unbelief. Gosh, I can't tell you how many times I've said that scripture, and every time it gets me. <laughs> and it gets me because it's, it's like that, that humility of the power and the presence of all that we are and all that we've been given. I, we are faith. We pray faith. We, we are the essence of faith. We can be faith. We can create the world that works for all. We can harmonize everything. We can heal anything with the love and the power of our faith. The possibilities are endless. And Jesus is standing before this man knowing that, embodying that knowing. And he's standing there, and I so want to be there too, he's saying. You know, I want to get the whole thing. So illuminate the darkness of my mind. Illuminate the dark corners of my heart. The places where I'm not sure. The places where I don't believe. Help me with my unbelief so that I can know and stand in the fullness that you are standing in before me. And the assurance and the faith and the knowing that my my son will be healed. And so I just feel that prayer, you know, for all of us, that we're all kind of crying out in a way, help our unbelief, you know, our collective unbelief in the world and our individual unbelief and the unbelief in our relationships that feel broken or confused or where we're not communicating and connecting, yet we know there is that base of love there or that our bodies feel like we're struggling and like we say fighting or battling things and it's like the fight and the battle isn't what's going to help it it's the surrender it's the surrender into the truth the base the foundation of faith that's what will heal us it's the thread pulled into the mundane life and then every day we're walking it and we're thinking it and we're speaking it and we're knowing it. And then before you know it, we're like that way shower Jesus. We are embodying it fully. And so that deep, deep desire, I think, is why this, that scripture always makes me feel emotional because I can align with that deep, deep desire to have all those little places of unbelief or lack or limitation illumined, you know? And that's the practice of faith. That's the practice that Charles Fillmore and Myrtle Fillmore used to heal their bodies and to launch a movement. It was the simple practice of paying attention to how we think and how we speak and aligning ourselves up instead of those limited ways into the abundant way that is that source, that is that space of spirit in which everything springs forth. So what we really are about in our practice is unbounding our, you know, there's a binding of our faith and we're just, un, we're, it's all bound up in the places where we think there's not enough or the places where we think we're not enough. And so it's an opening up 
and, and allowing that which we thought was missing, that which we thought was lacking, that which we thought was not enough, and opening to the truth that there is plenty and that we are plenty and that we are enough and that we're made of this source and that we have all the faith we could ever need. It's just bound up and, and hidden from us by these thoughts of lack and limitation that we're feeding it. And so our practice can begin as simple as paying attention to like the music you listen to and the movies you watch and the videos you're watching and the things that you're filling your mind with, you know, and, pay, and notice as you're taking it in, how do I feel? I really try to do this when I take in the news. You know, how do I feel? And then there's a point when it's like, okay, done. You know what I mean? <laughs> Hopefully I get it before it's like way up here. And time for some uplifting music. You know, and then pay attention to the music. How do you feel? Does it move you? Does it uplift you? Does it align you with the divine? Does it, does it, you know, is it like I, the song that we just heard? I have faith. I am faith. I pray faith. It, it reminds us over and over again of the truth. We've got a treasure trove of new thought music that will continue to align us with the divine. And so paying attention to those kinds of things. I've got a really mundane example for you, but hopefully you'll remember it next time you're shampooing your hair. <laughs> you know how the shampoo bottles has instructions? Lather, rinse, repeat. I've always found the repeat part, part kind of interesting, but, but when I apply it to this, it'll make more sense. And so as we you know, follow that, it's like the lathering is like the truth, right? So what, how do I speak to myself? What is the self-talk? that is going through my mind? What's the loop that's going through my mind? Is it a worry loop? Is it a, if this happens and that happens, and then, oh boy, we're in trouble. And so if this happens and that, you know, and then we do the loop. Do anybody do that? Is that just me? Yeah. <laughs> now while you're laying awake at night, you know, you can loop through that. Or you could instead like lather up with truth. You know, to just think of all the fantastic things you can think of, of who you are and what's going on in your life and, and how grateful you are and what's the truth of who you are. I am faith. I have the power of faith within me. I'm, I'm resting in the divine mystery right now while I wash my hair. And so we just kind of lather up all that truth, that, that affirmative truth. And then, of course, we rinse away that which doesn't work. You know, we rinse away the lack and the limitation. And then we repeat. <laughs> See, it does make sense now. And I tell you these silly you know, kind of metaphors because my hope is that next time you're shampooing your hair, you're doing this and you're thinking about this. <laughs> and then what do we do after we shampoo and we rinse? Some of us use conditioner, right? That's where we really get, you know, so we're conditioning our minds to align. We're conditioning our minds to faith. We're conditioning our minds to that deep, beautiful mystery of the source that created us. And when we do that over and over again, then we live it and we think it and we move and our whole being is in it. We don't even have room anymore for that place of lack. You know, I remember when I was originally told people in Missouri we were moving to California and people in my former congregation would say, oh, do you know what the cost of living is out, like the, out there? You know, and at first I was like, I had, you know, luckily I had been thinking about this ahead of time because I did go through a little bit of how are we going to make it work. But by then I was so like aligned with the move and the, and the faith of the move that it didn't even phase me. And so when she said that, I said, oh, that's none of my business. And she was... <laughs> But I really, that's where I was at that point, you know? So we, so we just, we keep doing our spiritual work and then we, we move through those places where we're in freak out mode or not enough mode or, you know, batten the hatches and circle the wagons because, you know, the sky's falling. And then we realize, oh, huh, that's not really happening, is it? And it's not really helpful to think that's happening, is it? Because the more we think about that and feel into that, the more we create that. The atomic bomb comes along and we can, you know, do good with it or do destruction with it. Amaze, I mean, really at the most powerful levels, right, of complete annihilation. And so it's true of all the things kind of that step toward those kinds of creations in our everyday life. We may think it's mundane in comparison, but it's the mundane that, that really pulls in the mystery. So next time we open our door, we can think about the space, the source, 
from which it comes. We can enter that kind of mystery, that kind of place where the, the, the uh, realm of the mind has to cross back over into the source. And what is on the other side of that door in Revelation 3.20, it says, listen, I stand at the door and knock. And if you will let me in, I will eat with you and you with me. And it's like the knock is coming from the inside of our hearts. You know, it's the spirit inside of us that going, can you hear me? I'm here. Listen, I'm here. Everything is, is more than okay. Everything is divine. There are all kinds of possibilities in your life that I want to uplift you to, that I want to show you, that I want to lead you into, but you keep thinking those loops of lack and limitation, and they keep you out of the abundant divine alignment that is yours. And so all we got to do is open the door. All we got to do is drop in, and there we are feasting on spiritual truth. There we are communing with the divine of our being and we're reminded of the essence of who we are, why we've come, who we are, what is possible. And when we feast on that then, when we take the time to practice and feast on that truth, then we just go out into the world and we share it. We live it, we walk it. I make that part sound so easy, don't I? Just leap right into that. And it is if we, if we remain true to our practice. It becomes easier and easier the more practiced we are. So listen, I'm standing at the door knocking, and if you hear my voice, open the door, and I will come into you, and I will eat with you, and you with me. It's a constant invitation available to us. All we got to do is answer the door and listen, right? All we got to do is open the door and begin to drop in and to practice. And we will be told and shown everything we could ever need to know at the very moment that we need to know it. As a friend of mine said, we always pray for guidance wishing for revelation, but it doesn't really work that way. <laughs> because if we got the full enchilada, we might go the other direction, you know? So, so Spirit gives it to us in the pieces and the steps that we can see, you know, as much as we, we will take and move into. There's a wisdom to that that is at work in this mystery. So what do you want to be your Christmas miracle this year? I mean, dream big. What would you really want for your Christmas miracle? In fact, take a moment just to drop in and see what comes to you in this field that we've created. If you could have anything in the world for yourself, for your family, for the world, it doesn't matter. There are no bounds. And as you hold that desire, that intention, that Christmas miracle, you begin to, to think it and to breathe it and to feel it and to move your being into its realization, into its fullness, into seeing it everywhere around you, into feeling it from within you. And that's how we co-create. And then you can link that mystery in, of, of your intention and your desire into mundane life and you can, you know, as you're cooking and as you're gardening and as you're shampooing and as you're whatever you're doing in day-to-day -day life, every time you open your door, every time you open your door, you think, listen, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Let me in. Let me feast with you. Let me give you the spiritual truth. Let me remind you of the truth of this Christmas miracle that you've called a miracle is not a miracle at all. It's an easy possibility. It can easily be achieved. Just keep your mind on it. Keep your thoughts on it. Keep doing your spiritual practice as the Fillmores would have taught us had they been here and they have taught us through their teachings and our lineage over and over again. So let's unwrap this truth this Christmas through the faithful practice, the faithful spiritual, or faithfulness to our spiritual practices. And we do that by surrendering our unbelief, by opening the door, by listening, by allowing, and by pulling those little threads of mystery as we come upon them into our mundane life and living from that place. Let's unbind our faith and let the miracles abound. And let's affirm this together as we close out. I unbind my faith through spiritual practice, miracles abound. And so it is. Thank you.